Okay, this video is going to be a quick review about intracellular calcium signaling and the effect of EMF on voltage-gated calcium channels. I know I've spoke about this before in several other talks and some of them I'll go into more detail different parts. I use these talks sometimes for different audiences. One of them will be for doctors, one of them will be for a lay audience, etc, etc. So anyways, this is some stuff I have to do briefly for doctors. Um, the electromagnetic spectrum, the main thing we care about is the radio frequency spectrum of like radios and microwaves. Uh, microwaves are especially the main one associated with cell phones and your Wi-Fi is around in these areas typically. Uh, but the other you know, uh, frequencies of current are also relevant. EMF means electromagnetic fields. EMR is electromagnetic radiation. Um, the Earth's magnetic field is all we had in the past was the Earth and the Sun. Uh, but then we had AC power, alternating current, like 60 hertz. And um, all of these things will generate some electromagnetic fields on us. Um, ionizing radiation means that the radiation has power enough to knock electrons off a molecule such that once an electron is knocked off, that molecule will then have a positive charge so we can make it ionic, charged. Okay, Non-ionizing isn't strong enough to directly knock an electron off, but you'll be surprised at how much... Uh, effect it can have on cells. Okay, what it's basically all about is, you know, cell phone towers, the cell phones themselves, laptop computers, smart devices, routers, Wi-Fi, smart meters, they're all giving off electromagnetic fields and these will open up voltage-gated calcium channels and because they're on potentially all day long, they can cause prolonged opening of voltage-gated calcium channels which can have a prolonged allowance of calcium to enter the cytoplasm of your neurons. Other cells that especially have a lot of voltage-gated calcium channels include your testicles, ovaries, and uh, the heart and the eyeballs. So little round things tend to have a special barrier on them, tend to have a lot of voltage-gated calcium channels. Also the heart though with all that muscle all concentrated together. So you don't want to put your cell phone in your front pocket. It could have a negative effect upon your heart, not to mention increasing your risk of breast cancer. And then we're going to go into some of the issues with nitric oxide and the different types of nitric oxide synthase. Okay, the classic thing people know if they know anything about nitric oxide is the work of Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. He wrote this great book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. He basically showed you could reverse coronary artery disease, or not necessarily reverse it, at least stop it from progressing, and quite often reverse it, improve the patient's symptoms, even showed on cardiac cath quite often, a decrease in the percent stenoses, and Ornish had showed a decrease in the amount of stenosis in some patients as well earlier with a vegetarian diet, almost a vegan diet. Um, and Esselstyn started then later on talking about even for some of the more uh, severely diseased patients to eat green six times a day. Sunshine will also increase your systemic arterial nitric oxide. The skin has precursors of nitric oxide that are then released into the blood when you're out in the sun. That's partly why it feels so good. You vasodilate quickly. Okay, uh, this guy right here, Nathan Bryan, is sort of the most famous expert in the world for nitric oxide. And he's actually friends with Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. Um, the thing I notice is, you know, almost all people don't know anything about nutrition and they say stupid stuff like they're worried about getting their calcium to prevent osteoporosis, getting their protein in middle and older age so they don't become sarcopenic and getting their good fats. I'll just let you know that's all fake nonsense for chumps. They, they try to trick you into thinking you need those things so that you'll eat more of those foods that just make you fat and sick. The real nutritional deficiencies that are most common in Americans are all come from a lack of plant foods, lack of potassium, lack of magnesium, lack of dietary fiber, and lack of nitrates. Okay, those are the things that you just get them from eating plants. Okay, and so what people tend to learn when they first start studying nitric oxide is all the good things about it, how it's a vasodilator, and so it opens up your arteries, better perfusion of your brain, your heart, and your Johnson. That's what Viagra does. It helps cause increased nitric oxide in the Johnson, so it'll work for people who it barely wasn't working before. Once the artery is fully occluded, though, the Johnson is not coming back. And so that's all the good stuff we hear about nitric oxide, especially with regard to enos. Enos, this is for endothelial it's also called type 3 because it can be in other types of cells. It's just especially associated, first studied in endothelial cells. And I remember that by E has three prongs coming off of it, and it's the number 3. Okay, for endos, that's neuronal uh, nitric oxide synthase in your neurons. I remember this is one stroke, one continuous stroke, and you use the number 1. To make the letter I for inos, this is inducible nitric oxide synthase. I remember it has two parts. It has a dot on top 
and then the straight part coming from below. There's some things that will uncouple nitric oxide synthase, and when it's uncoupled, instead of making nitric oxide the good thing, especially in the context of enos, it'll then make superoxide anions, a reactive oxygen species, a free radical, and that'll cause a lot of problems. Uh, so we'll talk about how that happens uh, in just a moment here. We're working towards it. And we also learned, you know, all the good stuff about nitric oxide. And this is with the work of Nathan Bryan and Dr. Esselstyn has interviewed him as well. You eat the greens, the bacteria on the back of your tongue convert the nitrites, NO3s, to nitrites. That should be nitrites, NO2s. They go in your stomach. The stomach acid helps convert it to nitric oxide. That's absorbed in your blood. Systemic positive beneficial nitric oxide effect. Don't use, uh, be careful with your toothpaste, your mouthwash, or your PPIs. He recommends avoid all those things. I avoid them all, uh, especially the F minus toothpaste, he meant in particular. Okay, and the idea was basically you do that and you live happily ever after. You know, all your arteries are open, so the Johnson still works. You know, your coronaries in your brain continue to work well, and you live happily ever after. And a lot of people used to think that's all there is to nitric oxide. And certainly, there is potentially all these good things in nitric oxide, but there's a little bit more to it. Oh, and by the way, uh, this is Dr. Caldwell Asselstyn. He's really tall with these long, gangly arms and legs and big, thick glasses. I said he kind of looks like a giant grasshopper, you know, and he's almost 90 as he may be going senile, uh, telling people to eat greens all day like a grasshopper. And then who's this other guy? Is like uh, Nathan Bryan, is Sancho Pancho's sidekick with uh, Don Quixote Esselstyn. I'm just joking around, but some people say, you know, Esselstyn, what I'm getting at is there's a group of doctors who say, no, 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 no. Nitric oxide's bad. It's the worst possible thing. It's causing brain damage. It's causing all kinds of other health problems. So I'm going to explain what's the, what's the, the real truth here, okay? All right, so here's the guy who's stirring up the fuss, Martin Paul. And this Martin Paul guy, when I first started listening to him, I thought, maybe is he crazy? But the more I listen, the more I think he's a genius and he's a heroic individual. This is his book, Martin Paul, Explaining Unexplained Illness, coming up with an explanatory paradigm for chronic fatigue, multiple chemical sensitivity, fibromyalgia, and a bunch of other diseases. And so how could this guy, you know, an obviously brilliant guy, be saying that nitric oxide is like the worst thing in the world and then Esselstyn saying it's the best thing in the world, okay? And by the way, I think they both deserve Nobel Prizes, okay? But how could this be happening? Okay, when, so when you see a contradiction, and there's other people, by the way, who support these points of view. You know, the other big spokesperson on the benefits of nitric oxide is this Beth Shirley PharmD lady, and she's a pretty bright lady. Um, the other big uh, proponents of the points of view shared by uh, Martin Paul are, to a large extent, Bob Miller and Jill Carnahan, MD. And they, you know, they don't all exactly say the same thing, but they tend to support these two main points of view. So there's a great philosopher, Soren Kierkegaard. I love Soren Kierkegaard. A lot of my guidance in my own life I take from Soren Kierkegaard. And Soren Kierkegaard is famous for saying some situations are either or. There is no synthesis, no compromise. You're either pregnant or you're not. Okay, you're either, you either believe in God or you don't. And that's why I think he, uh, Jordan Peterson, by the way, is a big phony because he just says he doesn't believe in God. How could you uh, say you don't believe in God and then, you know, claim to be pro-religion and all this other stuff? So anyways, we're not going to get into that right now. But the other point of view relevant to the moment is Hegel. And Hegel is famous for what was the idea of the thesis, antithesis, antithesis, and synthesis. And even though 99% of the time I favor Soren Kierkegaard over Hegel, in this particular instance, I think Hegel's way of looking at things is going to be beneficial. Okay, so this is uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And so what I'm basically saying is that uh, nitric oxide is a Dr. Jekyll and a Mr. Hyde. It's the good Dr. Jekyll in its normal context with endothelial nitric oxide. Uh, with NNOS, neuronal nitric oxide synthase, it could go either way. And with INOS, it sometimes is beneficial, but it's very often bad. And we'll explain all what that's about. Um, let me get the slide to move. Okay, the incidence of Alzheimer's is going way up. Alzheimer's has gotten a lot more common. Um, and Martin Paul thinks it's because of increasing dimension, because increasing nitric oxide in our brains. And I'll explain why he says that in just a moment. But there is a big increase in Alzheimer's, and Martin Paul's predicting it's going to dramatically keep coming up. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I worry about a cell phone and brain cancer. Forget about brain cancer. 
Brain cancer is so rare, it's not the issue. Cognitive impairment is the real issue. Everybody's at risk for cognitive impairment. And I see tons of patients all day long with cognitive impairment, and it's become more common, much more common than it used to be. Okay, this guy, Alan Frey, he showed back in the 1970s that uh, electromagnetic fields you know, at common exposures were opening up the blood-brain barrier. His research, to a large extent, kind of got downplayed, and, and then this other guy even wrote a book about it, how uh, his research was downplayed. All right, so anyways, this is one paper, too, showing that the EMF opens up the blood-eye barrier, just like the eyeball is like part of the brain, and it has its own blood-brain barrier equivalent, blood-eye barrier equivalent. The testes also got a blood-testes barrier, things with tight junction to help protect them from all the toxic chemicals in, the, in our blood and after we eat a meal. Okay, here's this guy by the name of Leif Seilford, and he is a neurosurgeon, Leif Seilford, out of Sweden. He was interested in studying the blood-brain barrier for uh, treating uh, glioblastoma multiforme, primary brain cancer. And he was interested in being able to open up the blood-brain barrier to get his chemotherapy medication to have more access to the, to the glioblastoma multiforme. <clears throat> and he kind of became concerned over time that, wow, we are really being exposed to a lot of EMF in the modern world with all these new technologies, a dramatic increase. He also noted you can get headaches from EMF because it opens up blood-brain barrier permeability. And then you can get blood proteins uh, across the blood-brain barrier into the brain parenchyma, things like uh, fibrinogen and albumin, and those can cause irritation in the meninges, the covering uh, linings and layers of the, of the brain surface, and that that could cause a headache. I think that's great because a lot of people have headaches and don't know what caused them. So that's one more potential cause of headaches. A little bit about the difference between oxidants and antioxidants. So basically, an, an, an oxidant is something that wants to steal an electron, electron stealers. And a lot of times it will be free radicals, meaning they have an unpaired electron in their outer orbital. Um, and as a pathogen, they'll steal an electron and not give it back. And once they steal that electron, the other thing they stole it from gets converted into free radical itself. And characteristically, they'll have a chain reaction where they try to steal an electron from the molecule next to them. And then they steal one, they steal one, and it leads to a big mess and it damages tissue function. Okay, the way you can neutralize a free radical is by having it react with an antioxidant. An antioxidant will have, um, typically it's a bigger molecule with a lot of double bonds and oxygens on it, and it'll be able to donate an electron to neutralize the free radical, but it'll stabilize it, and it'll be able to handle that and not become hyperreactive itself because it can delocalize the charge through all its great size, its double bonds, and its oxygen. So anyways, um, you have a balance between the amount of antioxidants and oxidants in your body. And when you have too many oxidants and they, they start weighing things down, they can cause oxidative stress. So reactive oxygen species are things like oxygen, O2 minus superoxide, anion, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radicals. Reactive nitrogen species are things like nitric oxide and especially peroxynitrite. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you always want to eat your plants because that's where you get your antioxidants from. So you'll have them all available to prevent you from having your free radicals uh, getting out of hand and causing oxidative stress. They come from the plants because if you look at it, they come from the plants. When you're out in the hot sun, let's say 100 degrees, the plant has to stay there. It can't go in the shade. The human says, gee, it's too hot. I'll go in the shade where it's much cooler. But the plant has to sit there all day long in the hot sun. So it needs chemicals, antioxidants, to protect itself from the overpowering energy of the sun. So here's another diagram of what this is all about. So here's an antioxidant, a big molecule. Like look at vitamin E. It's a big long molecule. It's got some double bonds on it that can resonate. And because it's got so many electrons and such large size, for it to donate one electron to a free radical is not a big deal. It still stays uh, without, it still remains not that reactive. Okay. And here's vitamin C, something similar. You can see vitamin C has got a lot more oxygens on it. It's more polar. So this is got more of a charge on it. This is more um, able to function in the cytoplasm, in an aqueous medium, whereas the vitamin E it functions inside the lipids, like your, your uh, plasma membrane, for example. Okay, so here's an unstable free radical. It has an unpaired electron in its outer orbital. The antioxidant donates an electron to it. I left the little red dot there to show you the original unpaired electron, but it really could all be, be all blue at this point. And then there's a donated electron. Okay, now the free, the antioxidants become a free radical, but it's a stable free radical, again, because of its large size and its ability to delocalize the charge. So it ends up being no big deal. Okay, and I introduced the concept of the last straw that broke the camel's back. We're all exposed to certain things that aren't so good for our health, and some of them we can't avoid. But most of them we can avoid, and it's wise to do that because 
you can just put that last straw on the camel's, camel's back and go into a pattern of irreversible disease, and you don't want that. Um, but that's also why when people tell me, oh, well, I'm cutting down, you know, on my oils, my fats, my caffeine, and all the other bad habits they do, their MSG, etc., their sleep deprivation, excessive stress, you know, you can't avoid everything, but do what you can. And, and don't push your luck because you could sort of tip over a threshold point and end up with irreversible disease. Talking about all the roads in ancient Rome, uh, in ancient Italy leading to Rome. And the point I'm going to make is in the human body, to, to get cells to do whatever they're made to do, usually it means to increase intracellular calcium. So we're going to talk about that. Yeah, once, once intracellular calcium goes up, when intracellular calcium goes up, the cell is activated to do whatever that cell does. Okay, so this is all roads lead to increased, all roads lead to increased intracellular calcium. And there's a lot of things that increase cytoplasm calcium. So if you've got chronic diabetes and hypertension for decades, you're going to be getting less oxygen in your tissue. So less oxygen is called ischemia. If you eat high dietary salt, you're going to be vasoconstricted, can lead to similar problems. Lack of dietary potassium and magnesium, lack of vasodilation, lack of ability to run your ATP-dependent pumps, more calcium in the cytoplasm. Leaky gut, it's a long story. I gave lectures before on how that leads to increased calcium in the cytoplasm. These excitotoxins, MSG, MFG. Okay, um, excessive psychological stress. So all these things are going to lead to increased cytoplasm calcium for multiple different reasons that I've talked about in other lectures. But just to realize that, that's why you don't want to add to this. You don't want to be doing anything where you get traumatic brain injury, okay? Uh, you don't want to hold your cell phone right next to your head. Uh, you don't want to be working with toxic chemicals that smell bad if you can avoid it. At least open the door, ventilate the place. Um, so that you don't kind of get tipped over a threshold and have neurons starting to die. So calcium, we said, is like the almighty uh, ion. And just like in the Lord of the Rings, they said one ring to rule them all. With calcium, it's one ion to rule them all. One ion controls the cell. In a sense, sodium, potassium, magnesium, uh, they're all working just to get calcium where it should be because that's what makes the cell like an on-off switch, do what it's supposed to do. Okay, and this is just another cell, another slide showing in more detail all the things that are increasing cytoplasm calcium. And all these things that increase cytoplasm calcium, when they increase the cytoplasm calcium, boom, you activate your nitric oxide synthase, it'll start making nitric oxide. And in the endothelial cell, that's usually a good thing. <clears throat> and when you eat the greens, you get more endothelial nitric oxide. When you get the sunshine, you get more vascular nitric oxide in the same effect. That's all beneficial. <clears throat> However, if you have a neuron that's excessively turned on, if you will, from too much EMF, too much Wi-Fi, keeping uh, neuronal nitric oxide synthase activated, <clears throat> you're going to start uh, making more of this than you want to. And you'll sometimes have other simultaneous problems causing it to become uncoupled where it's going to make superoxide anion. That's bad because the nitric oxide in this context, let's say inside of a neuron, can then react with the superoxide anion the free radical, of course, right here, too, that's also produced by saturated fat in the mitochondria. It'll produce peroxy nitrite. And peroxy nitrite is kind of a disaster. It goes around damaging all kinds of things in the cell um, to actually maintain its own concentration high, and it can cause uh, neuronal cell death, apoptosis, programmed cell death. And the point I'm going to make is, you know, I've talked before about excitotoxins, things that increase glutamate neurotransmission is an excitotoxin, uh, causes increased activation, hyperactivation. It's an excitatory neurotransmitter of the postsynaptic neuron. And all of these things will do it. Caffeine, sleep deprivation is a caffeine equivalent. Well, caffeine is a stress equivalent. Uh, corticosteroid medications, MSG, MFG, that's monosodium glutamate, you know, like glutamate, the neurotransmitter. And so all of these things are, are increasing cytoplasm calcium by opening up the NMDA receptor. In this case, the EMF stuff opening up the voltage-gated calcium channels. Um, the TRPV1 vanilloid receptors are opened up by a lot of these volatile organic chemicals, basically things that smell bad, some of these cleaning chemicals as well, things like formaldehyde. Uh, when I was in med school, <clears throat> freshman year, we had a cadaver assigned to five students. I went the first day, I thought it smelled, and everybody sort of you know, hovered over the body. You can't really see anything. Nobody knows what they're doing. I thought it was ridiculous. I just refused to go to the class. I didn't attend a single class after that. I just went to the practical the night before where the teacher had everything labeled, um, you know, because I didn't want to smell it. And, you know, formaldehyde is neurotoxic. It's also a carcinogen. But anyways, what I'm trying to say is when it opens up these channels, um, that will then lead to increased cytoplasm calcium. Um, hypoxia does it like ischemia. 
similar things for our purposes. And then the circuit inhibitors, because they're going to decrease, they're going to lead to increased cytoplasm calcium too. It ends up being that mitochondria inhibitors and circuit inhibitors end up having the same effect essentially as excitotoxins, an increase in cytoplasm calcium. So this is what I meant. So many things are causing this that you don't want to add to the problem. Another good reason to avoid caffeine, to avoid MSG, to avoid MFG, to avoid aspartame, to avoid psychiatric drugs if you can, depending on your situation with your doctor. Um, so, all right, we'll cover some of these in more detail later, but that was to make that point. Here's basically how your typical neuron functions. It has a cell body up here, and its nucleus is up here. The axon potentials typically begin in this spot called the axon hillock, the beginning of the axon. The axon is this long tube that extends down to the, <clears throat> the presynaptic neuron synaptic terminal, releases a neurotransmitter, goes across the cleft, excites the postsynaptic neuron. Well, actually, when the action potential reaches the synaptic terminal, it opens up these voltage-gated calcium channels. And when the calcium comes in and it gets high enough, it'll then cause uh, the release of the neurotransmitter. So the neurotransmitter will go across the cleft and activate the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, but that's an important point. These voltage-gated calcium channels, they've got a voltage sensor on them that's activated by EMF. Normally, it's activated by the action potential. And then it causes a major effect on the cell to release its neurotransmitter. And humans are quite electrical. We're electrical in the sense that we've got, you know, an EEG electroencephalogram can monitor our brain waves. A EKG electrocardiogram man, ma, uh, can monitor our heart function. Neuroconduction studies electricity in our peripheral nerves and muscles. <clears throat> so we're very electrical. We've got a voltage membrane gradient in our neurons around negative 65 millivolts. In our mitochondria, about negative 160 millivolts. So those, that's a big gradient. Okay, here's how a cell gets things done. The way a cell gets things done is with these ion pumps. It takes ATP to pump three, three sodiums out and two potassiums in, and that generates a negative charge across the uh, plasma membrane of the neuron, about negative 65 millivolts. You're pumping more positive charge out, three sodiums and two potassiums in, two positive charge in. Then this gradient, it's really a battery in a sense. You've got a charge differential across a barrier, and you know the current is when you're moving ions in and out. So anyways, you'll couple it to the NACA exchanger, Na for Na for sodium, Ka for calcium, and the NACA exchanger is used to rapidly pump calcium out of the cell. And you need to do that to quickly get the calcium concentration down from the cytoplasm after you've had it create its desired effect. And two-thirds of a neuron's energy goes to run this pump because it uses this battery, in a sense, to do most of its work in the cell. Again, the the gradient uh, is coupled to this uh, knockout exchanger, and it's both a chemical gradient in the sense that the concentrations are different, 10 times higher concentration of sodium outside the cell than inside the cell, so that's chemical gradient, but it's also an electrical gradient in the sense that the charge is different on the inside of the cell compared to the outside of the cell. So it's typically called electrochemical gradient. Ions tend to want to diffuse along the path towards a lower concentration. Okay, the next thing you need to know is that this calcium is very tightly regulated in the cell. You use uh, ATP coupled. So this is called primary active transport to transport based on ATP. And then when something's based on a gradient from an ATP pump, this is then called secondary active transport. Okay, circa the sarcoplasm endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase, which really in most cells is just the endoplasmic reticulum here, the ER, is a storage site for calcium, okay? The PMCA is the plasma membrane calcium ATPase, and that's used to pump. It's another pump to pump calcium out of the cell. This is a very fast one when the calcium concentrations are high. This is a slower pump and more relevant when there's smaller concentration uh, issues with the calcium to pump it out. But they're both important, and circa is real important as well for getting that calcium out of the cytoplasm quickly. Notice that you need ATP for all of these systems. Anytime you're pumping against a gradient, you're going to need ATP to pump against it. So that's why it takes a lot of ATP, and that's relevant because when you have decreased ATP production because of mitochondrial dysfunction, you can't run these ATP-dependent systems, and that means you can't lower your calcium effectively in your cytoplasm, and that ends up being a big deal. Okay, other receptors you're going to hear about is here's a glutamate receptor. First of all, glutamate will typically bind AMPA, the AMPA receptor, and that'll let sodium in. And when it lets sodium in, that'll depolarize the neuron, make its charge less negative, move it closer to a balanced uh, same with the inner uh, cytoplasm and the external matrix uh, charges. And then there's also NMDA receptor. Glutamate will bind to the NMDA receptor. It'll simultaneously bind glycine. It'll have a magnesium in its center, in the center of the channel. 
and when this becomes a polarized because of the increase in sodium entry through the AMPA channel, then the magnesium no longer has such a negative charge to be attracted to because that's a two plus positive charge and it'll bounce out of the, the channel here and that'll open up and then allow calcium to come into the cell. There's also such a thing as called metabotropic um, glutamate receptor. So this is ionotropic, meaning that it lets ions in. And so things that are ionotropic letting ions in, those are very fast acting channels because all they do is open up and let ions come in. It's also called a coincident detector because it has to both detect a change in the polarity of the cell cytoplasm as well it, ha it has to bind glutamate. So two things simultaneously have to happen and the magnesium has to move out, you know, related to detecting depolarization of the neuron. And that allows it to have a more graded response, which is, is going to end up being useful for learning and memory. So that NMDA receptor is quite important for learning and memory. We'll talk about that in another lecture. Okay, there's also such a thing as metabotropic uh, glutamate receptors. These are a little bit interesting because they're G-protein coupled receptors. And we're, we're not going to go into the whole pathway at this time, like phospholipase C and the way it cleaves, you know, PIP2 off the uh, plasma membrane. It actually makes IP3, if you will which then causes more calcium release from the endoplasmic reticulum. So that's a whole way to have an ampli amplified uh, cascade of enzymes and reactions. We're not going to get into all that today, but I'm just letting you know this, all this calcium stuff is related to that, and it's kind of interesting. And that's also why you don't want your, your calcium metabolism messed up or unnecessarily affected by external influences not related to your health. So basically, a cell does whatever it's supposed to do when um, calcium is increased in the cytoplasm. And it'll go up like tenfold, you know. Normally, you got about a 15,000 times higher concentration of calcium outside the cell than inside the cell. Okay. Okay, this is just showing a typical neuron. 80% of neurons in the brain release glutamate. Glutamate goes across to the postsynaptic um, cell and it'll then add its uh, plasma memory in the synaptic cleft have AMPA receptors. Those let sodium come into the cell, depolarizes the neuron. So instead of being negative 65, it moves to negative 40 towards zero and even positive. As it becomes more depolarized, that causes the magnesium no longer to be attracted to this negative 65 charge, which is gone. And then the magnesium will bounce out of the NMDA receptor and then calcium can enter. A little bit of calcium entry is all normal and it can be a very good thing, part of memory. However, when you have excessive amounts through prolonged opening of the NMDA receptor for whatever the reason or prolonged opening of voltage-gated calcium channels, excessively high calcium in the cell can activate calpain, which is a great name for an enzyme. Cal as in calcium, pain as in painful. It causes problems and it can eventually lead to apoptosis. It'll block the NACA exchanger, for example. One of the things it could do. Okay, this is just my theory of... Um, neuronal uncoupling here and um, let me show you here in this picture here so what I'm saying here is you've seen me talk about this before some of you just that basically normally you'll have the metabolic rate of the neuron equally matched to the oxygen glucose delivery but if you do things that increase the metabolic rate like you have caffeine you have aspartame MSG sleep deprivation you're psychologically stressed out cigarettes amphetamines ADHD meds and, and glyphosate is also an excitatory um, excitotoxin, and so is actually the beta amyloid oligomers. But all those things will increase the metabolic rate of this neuron, okay? And then if you simultaneously drop the oxygen glucose delivery, let's say from a high fat meal drops at 15 20% of vasoconstrictor like sodium, vasoconstrictor like caffeine, um, all those things make the problem worse, all right? And the bigger this gap gets between the metabolic rate and the oxygen glucose delivery, the more likely these neurons are going to start dying going into apoptosis. So that's the Peter Rogers MD theory of neuro of dementia and due to what is called neurovascular uncoupling. There's other theories out there, and I think they all contribute to some extent, but I think the two best ones are deletory theory and my theory because they tell you what to do. They tell you what to avoid, and I think that's part of a good theory. Uh, this GOD stuff is just glucose oxygen delivery. MR is for metabolic rate, okay? Whereas there's other theories, you know, you can talk all day about beta amyloid, but what good does it do you if, it, if you don't know what to do to, to minimize it and all the pills for it don't work? Okay, now here is um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The way nitric oxide can be both good, especially in the context of enos, endothelial nitric oxide, and in small amounts, physiologic amounts, it's good from neuronal nitric oxide. It's just when neuronal nitric oxide synthase can be overactivated because of keeping that voltage-gated calcium channel open too much, and then it can start causing problems. Okay. And I said, you basically, for your health, you got like a war going on. 
you know, all the health heaven things that are trying to help you, you know, low fat vegan diet and all the things we've talked about so many times. And then all the bad things going on. So you want your job to maximize all of these and to minimize all of these. And I would say also it's a little bit like the video game. You know those video games, Super Mario Brothers, and you know most video games. Your character kind of runs around and some bad things happen to your little action figure character. And so it loses its energy and then you do some positive things and then its energy goes up. And that's a lot like what real health is like. The body has a limited capacity to heal itself. So the thing a smart person will do is try to give it all the things it needs to heal, the healthy diet, the rest, the positive social environments, and then avoid all the bad stuff so you can heal. Because otherwise a lot of people, they'll heal, they'll get, they'll get two steps up of healing, and then they'll get knocked back down two steps, and they never get anywhere. They can't get better from their chronic diseases. So you have to break the cycle, break the spell, and stop doing the bad stuff so you give your body a chance to heal and not be knocked back down, you know? Okay, now this I think is one of the, the coolest slides on this whole talk. Um, so I spent a long time trying to figure this out and understand why Martin Paul and um, Esselstyn were, seemed to be contradicting each other. And what I realized is they're not. Endothelial nitric oxide is making nitric oxide open up your arteries, and that's a good thing. And eating greens helps. And getting sunshine helps. And exercising helps. That they're all good. And the low-fat vegan diet with no oil, no meat, not one drop, all that's all good. Ennos is more of a could go either way. It's good most of the time under normal conditions, but if you keep uh, those voltage gated calcium channels open too much, you're going to make too much nitric oxide. Normally, endothelial nitric oxide and Ennos are only on for brief amounts of time, you know, seconds or minutes, and they make tiny amounts, like nanomolar amounts, really tiny amounts, okay? Whereas nitric oxide that's induced, inducible nitric oxide, meaning that, so these come on right away when calcium is increased in the cell. Inducible nitric oxide is typically induced, meaning made by transduction, you know, transcription of the DNA. And so it can stay on for a long time, for hours and hours, and it'll make much, thousands and thousands of times more nitric oxide, you know, in micromolar amounts. And quite often, they'll simultaneously be another problem that maybe there's a lack of BH4 tetrahydrobiopterin due to a lack of uh, folate in your diet, not eating enough plant foods, not getting your vitamin C, not getting your vitamin B12. And that can lead to uncoupling of these nitric oxide thin phases where they start making superoxide anions. And then there'll be some nitric oxide around, and this will combine with the superoxide anions to make peroxynitrite. nitrite. And peroxy nitrite is a disaster. It goes around destroying things. Also, if you simultaneously got activation of uh, nitric oxide synthase, okay, NADPH oxidase, that will be activated by bacterial LPS, lipopolysaccharide, um, EMF activates it, mold, sulfites, um, even excessive glutamate can activate that. Um, xanthine oxidase uh, will be activated by ischemia. That will also make it. So anyways, there's other ways that this can happen. You don't want it happening. Um, the main thing that it activates nitric oxide through inducible nitric oxide synthase, the inos, is if there's some type of infection or if there's a lot of inflammation, um, problems with your immune system, excessive histamine. Um, glyphosate can do it too, the stuff on non-organic corn. Uh, insulin resistance, the glycation will lead to glycation uh, and worsen the process. Uh, chronic hyperglycemia can do it, high fructose corn syrup, maybe because of the HG head trauma, TBI, injury, I put it, because most of these things start with the letter I. I like they start with the letter I is how I remember them, and I knows. Um, antioxidants help to block all this, okay? So you don't head down this inflammatory uh, pathway. But anyways, this is the big reason why nitric oxide in the context, context of endothelial cells is a good thing, but nitric oxide in the context of being induced by inos more than what you need just to treat an active infection is the bad thing, because you'll start making peroxy nitrites, and they'll start... Uh, creating vicious cycles and positive feedback loops to destroy your brain cells. And by the way, it took me a long time to make these slides. This is from reading tons and tons of articles. So getting back to this, all these things are increasing your calcium. So you don't want to add to that. You don't want to add fuel to the fire. 
Okay, here's just a slide showing some of the bad things that peroxynitrite nitrite does. It will damage the plasma membrane calcium ATPA, so you can't pump calcium out of the cell. It'll damage the circa pump, so you can't pump calcium into the endoplasmic reticulum. That's going to lead to higher cytoplasmic calcium. It also damages the mitochondria, so it can't make as much ATP. That's going to lead to less ATP available to run the potassium sodium ATPase, and because you can't effectively generate enough of a gradient, electrochemical gradient, then you can't run NACA exchanger effectively. So all these things, it's a positive, a vicious cycle that has a positive feedback loop to increase itself. So once nitric oxide starts getting going, it can be hard to turn things around. That's why people can end up with these chronic diseases like multiple chemical sensitivities or chronic fatigue syndrome, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, this is just showing traumatic brain injury also will increase inos in the brain. And you don't want that. Other things that will do it, alcohol, alcohol will increase, so I had I for intoxication, will also increase inos, make excessive amounts of nitric oxide in the brain, cause brain damage. Alcohol actually damages the brain in other ways. Martin Paul makes the point that EMF guidelines tend to be based on thermal effects of EMF, but the thermal effects aren't even relevant. They're minuscule. They're, they're wrong. He says this is completely wrong. So that's why there's not as much awareness as there should be of the harmful effects of EMF. We talked about this in previous lectures, how you need to eat adequate amounts of potassium. Most people are potassium deficient, and they eat way too much sodium. And that leads to depletion, actually, of your, um, <clears throat> your potassium. Because when you eat excessive sodium, you'll actually your kidneys are designed to excrete potassium, and they'll void some of it out of your body. And the situation just gets worse, and you're going to dissipate this gradient. And when you dissipate this electrochemical gradient of sodium and plasma membrane voltage, your knock exchangers don't run so well, and you end up with uh, chronic elevated cytoplasm calcium in some of your important cells. Not good. You want to keep that K-factor ratio over 5. Our ancestors probably ate about 25 times more potassium than sodium. If you're eating meat and processed foods, you're going to get tons of... Meat and processed foods got tons of uh, sodium and very little potassium, so you can mess up this ratio, and that's why so many people in Western countries are hypertensive. Okay, now we're talking about, uh, actually we already showed the slide, it was just a reminder that if you dissipate this gradient, you won't have a good electrochemical gradient. The concentration, again, is typically 10 to 1, you know, 140 uh, sodium out compared to about 14 in. And uh, the, this gradient will also be dissipated, the charge across the plasma membrane. So you want, um, you, you don't want that high sodium diet. Don't get me wrong, it's, it's worse thing to eat all the fat, but the high sodium does have its negative effects. Okay, this guy Martin Blank wrote a good book called Overpowered about EMFs, and uh, we'll talk about his discovery on DNA. Um, this guy, oh, well, first of all, too, Sam Milham is a guy who also did some great work discovering cancer clusters at places where they have the highest levels of dirty electricity, including amongst teachers in some of these schools. And he said, yeah, good science alone does not change public policy. The only thing that can change it is a lot of citizens being aware. And it's very difficult to educate a large number of citizens. Most people are so functionally illiterate and oblivious. So you just pretty much have to learn for yourself and do what's best for yourself, your family, because unfortunately, good luck getting things to change in society. Michael Merzenich, co-inventor of the cochlear implant, he said, if you want to improve a brain, you want to improve performance in a brain, he says what you do is you train the brain. You want to get good at playing a musical instrument or something else, you practice, okay? And you practice, you get better. But he says if you want to decrease the performance of the brain, just add noise. And the point I'm making is EMF opening up the voltage-gated channels in your brain, that's noise, can degrade performance. Caffeine, stimulants, some of these psych meds, lack of sleep, they all degrade performance. So if you want to increase performance, um, you want to minimize noise. And again, I've seen some people who are like world-class researchers. I know people that were world champion athletes. And they would be very stoic and narrow in their focus because it enabled them to concentrate all their energy on what they're trying to achieve with their goals. So if you want to get better at something, that's a helpful thing to do. Uh, briefly, here's a picture of Bach. And he would make these fugues that were had self-symmetry, like a fractal. They repeat back upon themselves, repeating a pattern and making slight variations on it as one goes. Moritz Etcher, his art, would also do the same thing. It's also sometimes called tessellation. And the point is DNA is like that. It has this repeating structure that folds upon itself, much like a Bach fugue or a Moritz Etcher painting. Okay, and the relevance is that that can attract EMF to itself and cause EMF to interact with it more. And the whole point of this all is that DNA has a tendency to get uh, breakages when there's a lot of EMF around. 
And these damages in a breakage in the DNA can lead to mutations that can lead to cancer. So that's thought to be one of the major ways that excessive EMF exposure increases cancer risk. Okay, these are two of these guys who pioneered the work on this. This is Dr. Henry Lai, and I thought his name was funny. Dr. Lai is telling the truth about uh, DNA strand breaks from EMF exposure. He used something called a comic tail assay to show that. So Dr. Lai is telling the truth. And then here we've got George Carlo. And he was a pretty uh, good scientist who showed that the EMF was damaging the DNA, causing micronuclei, another thing to increase candy risk. And they both of them got screwed. They tried to, f to fire Dr. Lai, gave him a lot of hassle. Uh, George Carlo, as soon as he found that cell phones had a harmful effect, industry immediately withdrew his funding, tried to screw him over, discredit him. And sadly, that happens all the time. When scientists do something good, they try to discredit them, they try to defund them, they try to get them fired. Um, and at the very least, they try to hide their work, okay? And you'll notice, you know, I'll tell you the truth about something to help you get healthy. I'll get you what, you know, 100 views, 200 views, whereas somebody's up there lying to you about paleo, keto, carnivore diet, or some other BS, some nonsense about, um, you know, olive oil or something, they're going to get, you know, millions of views, okay? So anything that promotes industry gets uh, kind of favored in society, and that's why most people have incorrect information on health topics. Okay, here's just a mitochondria, outer membrane, mitochondrial membrane, inner membrane of space, inner membrane, mitochondrial matrix. And that's where all our energy is made, almost all of it. Electrons are passed down like a fireman bucket brigade to progressively more powerful grabbers of electrons uh, until they reach, you know, like cytochrome C here, complex four, and that presses four electrons um, onto the oxygen and converts it into H2O, to water. And it runs like a water mill wheel here that you've been pumping out protons at each of these complexes, other than complex two doesn't pump protons. But anyways, these other ones pump protons. And they will then uh, build up a gradient of protons across the inner mitochondrial membrane. IMM is inner mitochondrial membrane. IMS is intermembrane of space. And then you can let one come back in along its gradient. And that can be coupled to the production of ATP. Usually when you get electron leak, it's like around complex three or sometimes complex one. But I especially have seen it happen around complex three and complex three and what I've read. But you seldom see it from complex four. Cytochrome C is pretty good at grabbing onto those electrons and not letting them leak. All right. Um, here we have, like I said, it's an incredible gradient, like negative 160 millivolts across that inner mitochondrial membrane. You sometimes leak them also from the, re the region of coenzyme Q. And usually we're pretty good at neutralizing them fast. There's an enzyme called superoxide dismutase that's pretty good about neutralizing them into um, safe products. And eventually that reacts, and there's another step to it. It ends up being water. Okay, if you leak too many of these superoxide anions, you can run into problems. If there's some simultaneous nitric oxide present, they can make these super they can make these peroxy nitrites, and that's a problem. They even call this the no o oh, no cycle for that to happen. If there's any free iron around, that's a bad problem too, because it'll interact especially with hydrogen peroxide, and it can very rapidly produce peroxy uh, I'm sorry, hydroxyl radicals, and the hydroxyl radicals can destroy these lipid membranes. This is called the Fenton reaction. Easy to remember, F E for ferrous for iron, like rust in Italian, and Fe for fenton. Fenton is the name of the scientist who discovered it. Okay, and then here's another point I'm showing. These are all mitochondria inhibitors, and the point of this is you read a college or med school biochemistry textbook, they won't even give you any mitochondrial inhibitors, or maybe they'll mention one research-type chemical, okay? And that's crazy, because in the real world, I just was curious about it, because I knew it was a problem, and I very quickly found like 45 of them, okay? And about 30 of these are common. Of course, fat, especially saturated fat. Atrazine, which they sp spray on the uh, non-organic corn. And if you look at these closely, you'll see tons of them, and you're probably exposed to several of them, so you don't want to add to that. Okay, this is just a, kind of a repeat slide reminding us that we need ATP to pump uh, the calcium out of the cytoplasm, either from our, our coupled to the gradient NACA exchanger, our plasma membrane calcium ATP is our circle pump. And if you don't have ATP because your mitochondria are dysfunctional because of mitochondria inhibitors, um, you're going to end up not being able to run these pumps and your cytoplasm calcium is going to go up. Okay, these are just some papers also showing that um, excessive EMF exposure, it also lowers sperm counts in men, and it lowers the sperm motility, and it can make them infertile. And it can also make females infertile, and it cause problems with their pregnancies, but it has a more powerful effect on men, this EMF property. And, of course, the stupidest thing to do would be you know, putting your laptop on your lap or putting your cell phone in your front pocket. Low-power microwave transporters right next to your balls. You're frying your balls. Not smart. 
A lot of young guys do that. Like they lift weights and then they have their cell phone in their front pocket. Totally stupid. <clears throat> okay, vicious cycles. <clears throat> There's a lot of these vicious cycles. So just eating bad food every day is a vicious cycle in the sense that you're adding something uh, negative to your health to, to perpetuate the process. And there's toxins in your food, toxins in your water. So you got to be pretty careful about what you eat. You got to filter your water to optimize health. And then here's some ways that uh, peroxynitrite nitrite can create vicious cycles. We went through some of that already. Um, this is just showing more of the trouble peroxynitrite nitrite causes. It does other things too. It actually damages the NMDA receptor function in part by lowering the available uh, ATP. It's a long story, but that makes it uh, dysfunctional. Okay, some good news is the dietary fiber, just like it protect, protects the gut barrier, it also protects your um, blood-brain barrier. It's used to make the short, the tight junction. So the the bacteria in the gut convert the fiber, your dietary fiber, that's why I call secret fat uh, dietary fiber, because it gets made in these short-chain fatty acids. To acetate is two carbons, uh, propionate is three carbons, and butyrate is a three-carbon uh, fatty acid. <clears throat> and they are used to make tight junctions, so they maintain your blood-brain barrier, they maintain your gut barrier. So fiber, once again, comes through to do great things for you. This is a slide I got from Gurmeet Singh Manku. He's an expert on nutrition, especially he studies issues related to nutrition in India. Fiber has um, comes all from plant foods. There's no fiber in animal foods. It's exclusively from plants. You don't have any fiber in oil or in sugar, so you got to eat your plants if you want to get adequate fiber. You know, It's much better to get it from eating your food than taking supplements. Other things you can do, you know, try not to live near a power line. Try not to have a cell phone tower right next to your house. Uh, shield your bed. Shield other things when you can. Switch over from Wi-Fi to hardwired. Turn your Wi-Fi off at night. Have a metal, have a bed mattress with no metal springs. Change your glasses, your eyeglasses frames from metal to plastic. Um, try not to give your kids a cell phone. You know, as little as possible, late as possible. Teach them to tech rather than talk on it. But good luck controlling them when they're not around you. Um, I think it's a bad idea that Wi-Fi is in the schools. They should do all that hardwired. All this Wi-Fi stuff could be replaced by hardwired stuff in your house and by um, fiber optics on a larger scale. Uh, so these are some of the things you can do to protect yourself. Uh, what else? We talked about all the diet stuff and then all the psychosocial stuff. We talked about that before. So anyways, I uh, hope that was helpful. That was just a quick overview of intracellular calcium signaling and its relationship to EMF.